I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you on this topic. Uh, uh, you know, pretty basic what heat stress is to, to a cow. Uh, it's her ability not to be able to get rid of the heat that she's gained uh, during this, this uh, uh, day or so. And time does play a role, and it's really trying to balance that. Uh, cows are homeotherms. They, they have a relatively constant body temperature. If, you know, 101.5 or something like that, if it goes, you know, more than a degree above that, then they're starting to experience heat stress. But if we can bring her core temperature back down uh, to that normal uh, uh, temperature in that 24-hour period, then she's probably not going to experience that. But days, like at least we've had in southern Pennsylvania here the last week, if it doesn't get below 70 degrees at night, she's going to have a, a harder ability to get rid of that heat uh, during the evening and, and do that. And as uh, Julio is saying, I mean, heat stress affects lactating cows negatively, it affects dry cows negatively, and it can affect those unborn calves negatively. And so it really is an important thing that needs to be taken into uh, account on the dairy. I've heard a lot about the temperature humidity index or the thermal uh, uh, heat index is, is sometimes called. This is the, the equation that, that, that we use. And, but you have to keep in mind that this doesn't take radiation or air movement into account. Uh, temperatures, dry bulb temperatures are shaded temperatures. They're not in direct sunlight. And so it could be a lot worse standing out in direct sunlight, of course, than getting that radiant energy. As far as that goes, any air movement over us is going to prevent, for lack of a better term, wind chill, which is going to affect that too. So we have to keep that in mind as we look at these things. But dairy cows, it's really commonly uh, accepted that 72 or so, uh, anything greater than that affects dairy cows. Cows that are producing 70 pounds, 77 pounds or more uh, a day are probably affected at a lower THI. That's 68 that's kind of come before, uh, uh, before us now. And also pregnancy loss in some research is indicated maybe as low as 60 or 64 THI. And so take that into account. These, of course, go into that nice chart that we can, we can look at. But remember, that's an index. It doesn't have... Uh, a unit. It's not degrees Fahrenheit, which I just recently saw in, in some recent publications. It's an index. And I think that's important to look at. Uh, Joe uh, Horner, Harner at uh, Kansas State did some research looking at uh, the temperature humidity index where it averaged 68 uh, or a minimum daily temperature humidity index of 65 in 21 cities across the U.S. Uh, over 20 year period. The hourly data over 20 years. That's a lot of data by the way, that he looked at. And here in this graph on the left, the, that bar is the THI at 68 and the THI at 65 is on the right. And we look at that, I'll just uh, say in southern tier states, they're looking at 140 to 180 days a year where those temperature humidity indexes are in that range. Along the, and this is one correction in the proceedings. I mistook this, it's uh, north 40 degrees latitude, which is kind of goes through southern Pennsylvania and and, and uh, across the United States, 89 to 140 days. And then up here in the northern regions, less than, than 80 days. One of the mistakes in the proceedings is I put 70 degrees. I don't think the Arctic Circle <laughs> heat stress is, is uh, definition up there is probably a little different uh, than, <laughs> yeah, 70 degrees latitude. And so if you make that correction, I'd sure appreciate it. He also looked at the comparison of the temperature versus the THI uh, index in these, these various states. And what he came up with is basically in dry climates, uh, the temperature humidity index is five to six units less than the actual temperature. Okay, so it's not necessarily 72 degrees that you start doing things in some cases. In humid climates, like we have here in the Northeast and Upper Midwest, it's maybe two to three units. And so that's something to, to keep in mind. Methods to reduce heat stress, well, it's pretty simple. If we can slow the heat gain that the cow has uh, from the environment, we're going to do some good. And if we can improve her ability to get rid of the heat that she's gained, we're going to do that. So that's simplistically how it is. And there's four heat transfer methods that we rely on in order to do this. And that's uh, conduction, which occurs between stationary objects. So if you've got a, a warm cow resting on a cooler stall base, there's going to be a heat transfer from her. Warm wants to get to cold. It's going to go into that stall and cool her down. But unfortunately, that stall starts to heat up close to her temperature. And so it's a relatively short distances. And it's not very effective overall in, in uh, uh, hot environments for transferring that heat. And then, of course, radiation, direct sunlight. We want to get them out of that. But it's also radiation from a, a roof, you know, an uninsulated roof. 
uh, indirect evaporation reflecting off a concrete surface or some other thing that's going to affect her. But keep in mind, too, that the cow who is hot going to a very cool, uh, clear sky, she can get rid of her heat very efficiently uh, in that uh, effect. So again, looking at that 24-hour period of trying to get rid of that heat stress or that heat gain, uh, that comes into play as well. Convection is that heat transfer, basically a fluid layer that is surrounding the cow that is picking up that heat and transferring it, and then we move that away in some way. That can be you know, air, water, or, or blood. As the blood circulating gets closer to the skin, it's going to help get rid of some of that temperature as well. Natural convection, warm air rises, and, uh, so, but it is a very small contribution. But if we can put wind or f some energy into that, to blow that fluid layer that's surrounding that cow away and replace it with fresher, drier air, cooler air, it's going to be more effective heat transfer as well. And then there's evaporation change. That, that change in phase from a liquid to a, to a gas. And one pound of water takes approximately 1,000 uh, British thermal units, BTU, of energy uh, to, to, to accomplish that. Or a gallon of water, probably at 8,300. A pint's a pound the world round, so basically that one pound uh, it takes 1,000 BTUs in order to do that. And one BTU, just to give you a reference, is equal to the energy given off or the heat given off by a 4-inch kitchen match, wooden kitchen match, to give you an idea of what that is. It is an efficient and effective means of heat transfer. Uh, well, that's what the cow is trying to do when she's panting. Okay, she's evaporating that moisture in the respiratory tract to help cool that air. She inhales that out, exhausts that, cool, or that warm air uh, in that way. Also evaporation from the skin, cows do sweat at least a little bit, and the ability to evaporate that off her skin is going to provide some cooling. Basically, it's like putting your hand in a pail of water, bringing it up into a breeze, that cooling effect that you get, uh, that's what's happening there. Things that, that help evaporation is higher temperatures. As the temperature gets warmer, its ability to pick up moisture increases. Okay, so the more moisture can pick up, the more cooling that can, be, can take place. Of course, lower humidity allows more space in that air to pick up moisture so that uh, we can get greater cooling effect. And then higher air speeds over that to uh, help evaporate that moisture uh, faster. Bob Graves, who is a professor emer emeritus at Penn State in Ag and Bioengineering, came up with this term a long time ago, this SAW, in response to, to cattle heat stress. And the S in SAW is shade. Getting those cows out of uh, direct sunlight is certainly going to improve their ability to cool themselves. Uh, air is uh, the two A's there. One is the air exchange. We want to get rid of the heat, but we want to control moisture, gases, dust, and pollutants in that uh, uh, environment as well. It's a very important element in the overall uh, ability to, to cool cows. And then that air movement, that forced convection that we talked about. And then water, of course, drinking water has got to be available to the cows. We'd like to have that availability uh, to be, uh, have the ability for maybe 15 to 20 percent of the herd to drink water at the same time if they need to uh, in that case. Um, and then evaporative cooling. Uh, that's the other water that we're looking at in that. Shade, as I mentioned, uh, makes them feel less hot. Uh, it lowers their body temperatures and lowers respiration rates uh, in that case. And in shade, you'll see cows in grazing herds, they head to the shade, and that's where they'll stay until night. Then they'll come out and graze in that way. And so providing that shade close to feed and water is very important for those cows so we can maintain that milk production uh, in that, uh, during these hot times. Air exchange, trying to control those levels of moisture, gas, and uh, pollutants and heat, as I mentioned. Getting the warm, moist air out uh, of the barn, bringing fresh, dry air in. Very, very important especially when we're talking about methods of evaporative cooling. That can be driven either mechanically or naturally, uh, but we want to see at least, at least one air exchange per minute in order to accomplish this. Uh, the best I've ever been able to do in dairy facilities is to measure a dry bulb temperature, a shaded dry bulb temperature of one to three degrees warmer than what it is outside in the shade because we've got all these furnaces in there uh, adding heat to that. And so usually that's how I'll judge a good system if we can get within that. But remember that all other heat abatement methods that I've mentioned limited by a poor air exchange. If we don't get rid of that moisture, if we don't get rid of that heat, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse uh, in that building. Uh, as I mentioned, it can be achieved by a number of ways, mechanically or natural. Each one has advantages. Each one has a disadvantage. Uh, tunnel ventilation, cross ventilation do provide a predictable air exchange, 
but there's some issues with air distribution, uh, power use, and some of those things uh, as well in, the, in, in those buildings, getting it where the cow needs it. Force convection, helping to carry that uh, heat away from the cow's body, creating that turbulent air movement around them, uh, and also increases the evaporation rate when we're looking at evaporative cooling. We try to get in the range of three and a half to five miles an hour if we can, or better, but three and a half to five is where we kind of start. We want fans over the resting area, because guess what? We want cows to rest 10 to 14 hours a day, and so we ought to put emphasis on that resting area. We want them to eat, too. They're going to be eating maybe six, five to six hours a day, so we want to put some priority there as well, uh, but we want to encourage them up. But we want them to be comfortable throughout the entire animal space. Inline fan spacing for, is typically... Uh, Looking at 10 times the fan diameter to keep that uh, air movement relatively consistent, especially when cows are, are in that space. In a single row, uh, over uh, in single row stalls, 10 times the diameter. Over a feeding area, 10 times the diameter. Or if a do double row using a single row of fans, head to head stalled single row of fans, we bring it back to eight times the diameter uh, in that case. Mounting heights about six to eight feet above the surface. If it's an unguarded fan, OSHA says eight feet, and so we ought to listen to that, uh, keep that in mind, and then tilt it down so that the, the air movement is at animal level when they're resting. We're not trying to blow air over them, we're trying to blow air around them and disturb that, uh, that uh, convective layer. Smaller diameter fans may provide more even airflow along the length of that, of that barn compared to bigger fans. But larger fans move larger volumes of air and also in a wider swath. And so there's some advantage to that too, but keeping within the spacings that we mentioned earlier. So fans over each stall row, uh, whether it's double, that's the preferred. More air over the cows is always better. Single row of fans over head to head, again, spacing them uh, eight times the diameter. Just graphically here, putting uh, uh, the 10 times diameter of the fans along the feeding area as well as that single row of stalls that might be on the outside row, and then double fans here trying to get more air towards the center of the barn, maybe even important in, in, more important in wider barns, four and six row barns, uh, where the center of the barn tends to be a little more stagnant uh, than, than the outside uh, rows. Uh, single row of here, just placing those fans um, a little bit closer in the middle in order to get good even airflow over those cows uh, head to head. In bedded pack areas uh, where we want to have good air circulation, a lot of the times fans are placed over there as well, but usually side by side. One reason is we want to get equipment in there to clean and, and bed, and, and fans over the, the bedded area may uh, interfere with that, the, with the clearance height. Generally, if they're side by side, it's two to three times their diameter. So a four foot fan, we'd want to be uh, uh, you know, in the range of, of uh, eight to 12 feet apart in order to get fairly uniform airflow. Uh, coming out of out of there. In a holding area, we want to put fans. What's the worst place to put cows on a hot day is closely touching each other, you know, and, and we want to minimize it. We'd like to keep the stress low right before they melt kind of thing. Uh, so this is a place to, to put them as well. But spacing those fans, again, uh, according to these, in these uh, holding areas that are a little wider, placing them two to three times their diameter apart, and then maybe six to eight di times their diameter uh, in line in order to provide good air movement in that barn. Holding areas that are a little narrower, we can put those in the side walls, forcing air in across the cows, but again, putting enough of them uh, so that we get uniform distribution of that uh, uh, convective uh, flow over the cows. There are some other fan designs out there. there you, now this one, in, for instance, is a, a six foot diameter fan, which uses these louvers. The idea that we can uh, you know, use a bigger fan, we don't need as many of the fans in the barn, it's gonna blow air further. I would just caution you on some fan designs that say we can throw air further. Uh, we wanna put air movement around the cows effectively in that three and a half to about five mile an hour range while they're resting, uh, for instance. We don't want to blow it over them. And one thing I've seen with fans over the years where they, they put bigger motors and smaller pulleys and things like that to say we can blow the air twice as far in that effective range is they're missing the first few uh, cows because of that, because it's coming out in a fairly concentrated stream and not spreading out and giving the air movement we need. So I would be cautious of that. Some of the high volume, low speed fans, the helicopter fans, or some people know as the large posterior fans, uh, typically anywhere from eight to 24 feet uh, in diameter. 
But the way these fans work is they, they're sending air down to blow across the surface. It billows out and, and provides that. But as this diagram here, some work done in uh, University of Wisconsin, it's really in the effective air speeds about uh, 10 feet beyond its, in this case, a 20-foot fan, maybe 10 feet beyond its uh, uh, diameter. And so it's really important with these types of fans to put them directly over the cows, not over the feed delivery alley, because if it's over the feed delivery alley, it's blowing down on that alley, uh, blowing into a dam of cows that are standing at the feed area and not getting back to the resting area. And so we want to put it over the animals and space these units no further than twice their diameter apart. And that's pretty typical. And remember that circulation fans do not exchange air. They may encourage an airflow in some cases when the wind isn't blowing, but don't count on that. They're egg beaters. All they're doing is just moving air around, circulating it in the barn, getting rid of those hot spots, and trying to uh, create that turbulent layer around the cows. One thing I did want to mention is there's some, some work, and in fact, there's a presentation going on now in another room on this uh, uh, conductive cooling uh, on resting surfaces. This was a study done in, in Arizona where they used heat exchanger mats below 10 inches of, of bedding uh, in that case. And they circulated 45 degree Fahrenheit water in these, which helped to cool that bedding and draw the air. They used this conductive, but I would say it's, it's both conductive and convective since we are carrying that heat away uh, from that. One of the issues with these, these mats aren't cheap, and they use 10 inches of bedding so the cows didn't tear them up with their hooves when they're getting up and down. And so they're trying to do some more research to find out what they can do to improve this system and get it a little more practical for, but it is working, it's lowering core temperatures, and uh, it's something I think it needs to be looked at. Cooling cows with water, drinking water, we want to have that as well as, uh, again, looking at uh, providing an opportunity for 15 to 20 percent of the herd to drink at the same time. Then we look at evaporative cooling, and this is a very effective method uh, in the Northeast and, and Upper Midwest to cool cows. Basically, evaporation moisture, uh, evaporating moisture from the skin, uh, and uh, I think it is the best method to use uh, in these climates. But remember, since we're adding moisture to that environment, we need to have that air exchange to get rid of that excess moisture so fresher, drier air can get in uh, the building. Uh, it is intermittent wet and wetting and drying because it's the, the evaporation that's doing the most effective cooling. While that water falling on them is cooling them, uh, evaporating that more moisture is more effective. So it's intermittent in this rate, and the research shows that the respiration rate lowers almost immediately. After, after the first application, it goes down. The second application, it goes down. I asked the researchers, when does it go to zero? That's not good. Uh, but they say it just gets closer to normal, and so that's that's something to keep in mind. It's a low pressure system, 10 to uh, uh, 20 PSI. We want a coarse droplet so that that droplet penetrates the hair coat, gets down on the skin, uh, so it can be evaporated off the skin. We don't want it to collect uh, between those hair follicles. We want to wet six feet behind the uh, fence line of the feeding area. Uh, spray nozzles typically uh, six to eight feet apart at a half gallon or up to maybe a three quarters gallon. In some cases, a gallon per minute per nozzle in, in some of these. We want that coarse droplet. Generally start at around 70 degrees Fahrenheit maybe. Want to apply five hundredths of an inch of, of water per cycle. Don't try to measure, measure it. Just figure it out, you know, square feet times, uh, 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 times or yeah, square inches times inches. Uh, you can change the square feet. You can get the gallons per hour that you need to be delivering there in that case. And the fans run continuously. There's some work before where we'll shut the fans off to allow that droplet to soak down into the cow. But that was when the droplet was much finer than what we're, we're after now, and there was a lot of drift occurring in that way. So running fans continuously is, is typical now. Wet the cows one to two minutes per cycle. As the temperature goes up and the evaporation rate goes up, we can shorten that cycle because the evaporation off the skin is faster. So it, as we go from 70 to 80, it might be a 15-minute cycle. 81 to 90, it might be a 10-minute cycle. And then above 90, it might be a 5-minute cycle in those cases. But one of the issues with this type of system, it requires a significant water demand and all at once in many cases. And so systems have to be designed to keep, uh, to keep that, uh, uh, to meet that peak demand that's, that's going to happen. Holding area spray cooling, probably the first place it should be considered. Again, because we're packing cows in there pretty tightly, we can also drain that moisture away pretty good. We use three to 60 degree nozzles, just trying to, to uh, wet the entire area, still doing the intermittent 
uh, type of spraying. There's another one that's pretty popular, at least in our area, this IWOB, which is just a big, large capacity uh, nozzle that you can put in there, and it'll spread up to 40 feet uh, in diameter. And it does, it's very, fairly easy to install and does an effective job. A lot of producers like it. Something people are also trying is return lane cooling, basically trying to get, you know, soaking them as they leave uh, the milking center, which uh, is a way to do it. Some of the problems with these is, is they're not used to it initially, and they might be startled by it. Once they get used to it, they don't want to leave, is a, you know, another one of the problems. But there's a lot of pros to it. It is an effective method of cooling cows in, the, in these northern climates, more humid climates. It adapts to several freestall and, and uh, uh, building configurations. It is a low pressure system in that way, but it does require a lot of water volume. You can't use it over a resting area, especially with organic bedding, and it does require drainage, and it does uh, use a lot of water, as I mentioned. The other method of evaporative cooling is indirect, where we're trying to cool the air surrounding the cow, so we get a greater temperature difference between the cow and her environment, so the rate of heat transfer from her to the environment is better. She's also breathing in cooler air, and it's going to help her do that as well. It, again, we're adding moisture to that environment, so we need to have an air exchange that's going to get rid of that excess moisture bring fresher, drier air uh, into place. So fogging and misting systems are those. They emit a droplet into an air stream. Um, again, as I mentioned, cools that surrounding air and they in inhale that cooler air. Operated properly, the cows, the stalls, and all surfaces will remain dry. It typically uses less water than spray cooling systems. But smaller droplets are more likely to evaporate before hitting a surface. Keep that in mind. Because we don't want those droplets to settle on the hair coat Okay, if these are the hair follicles and those droplets settle on there, now that becomes a blanket that's going to retard any heat transfer uh, from the cow. So we don't want, want that to happen. High pressure fogging systems, and I consider high pressure somewhere between 600 and 1500 PSI, preferably for, be towards the top, because that's going to have a smaller droplet, a finer droplet that is more likely to evaporate in varying air conditions uh, than a larger droplet before it hits the surface. In many cases, multiple systems are required in order to meet those varying air conditions that we have during the summer here, where we have a more humid day, we don't need as much, but in a, you know, during the peak of the day when it can pick up more moisture, we can add another lane. Here's an example in a, in a tunnel ventilated freestall barn where they had three systems that would come on depending on the outside air conditions uh, so that they didn't get those wet surfaces. Uh, the pros, again, it's, it lowers the air over the animal space, it adapts to several building configurations and can be used over the resting area, uh, which, is, which is good. But it requires high pressure plug or pumps. Those nozzles are pro prone to plugging. Uh, there's a limited cooling window in most of these uh, types of systems, can create wet surfaces, and these droplets are susceptible to drifting. I've been in naturally ventilated barns using these systems. You see the mist just going right out the barn. You know, it's not doing any good. It's cooling the outside, which I guess is good for whoever's outside, but medium pressure systems, which are sometimes used, are considered somewhere between 200 and 600 PSI. It's going to be a little larger droplet coming out of there. Uh, those are usually nozzles installed on a, at the uh, exhaust side of a fan, and they use intermittent operation. Keep in mind, intermittent operation means cool, then hot, cool, then hot, and depending on how that is. So same types of things as we mentioned with the other, other than these systems are a little more susceptible to getting the cow wet uh, in that case. But that high volume of air coming off the fan or that high air speed can help evaporate that moisture even if it settles on the cow. There's a low pressure system as well. No pumps required. Usually just take it right off your well pressure. The same thing, nozzles are installed to circulation fans, intermittent operation. has very simple parts and installation. And so this is something that was, you know, kind of exciting in the system as well, at least the proposing of it. But again, that droplet's a little bit bigger and a little more likely not to be able to uh, evaporate. And so it needs that high air speed on that fan in order to attempt to uh, evaporate that before it, before it hits a, sur uh, a surface in that way. One more ev method of evaporative cooling or indirect evaporative cooling is evaporative pads. All the incoming air in a tunnel ventilated or cross ventilated barn now is coming through a soaked pad. And so that's, uh, that process, evaporation process is going on there. And so it's going to lower the temperature of all the incoming air 
in those barns and can work out real well. It does work well in, in uh, tunnel and cross ventilation systems. That type of system may, uh, or at least the, the material used in that evaporative pad may minimize the wind effects compared to a clear opening that we have in tunnel ventilation barns. Uh, and there's a slight increase with the right air exchange, there's a slight increase in temperature from one end to, uh, from the inlet end to the exhaust end of the barn, which works out pretty good. The advantage here is the inlet air only picks up as much moisture as it can. And so you're, you, if it's soaking anything, it's soaking right near the pad. It's not soaking the rest of the barn uh, in that case because it, uh, that's, that's a real um, advantage. A number of years ago, I, I compared two tie stall barns. We were only 10 miles apart. Similar uh, cow numbers, the same number and type of fan. One was a high pressure misting system, the other was an evaporative pad. Uh, on one day when it was 90 degrees, we, the uh, evaporative pad barn was able to drop the temperature 15 degrees and it gained about 2 degrees as it went down the length of the barn. The high pressure misting system, uh, the air at the inlet end was 2 degrees cooler than it was outside. It was 4 degrees in the middle and 8 degrees at the fan end. So as that air was moving, it was cooling. And so this end of the barn wasn't taking full effect. The other end uh, had that. Again, it was intermittent. And when you have a 45 second air exchange and uh, intermittent uh, spray of every three to five minutes, guess what happens in between? <laughs> it cools down, it warms up, cools down, warms up. So anyway, the problems, or the, the uh, advantages of evaporative pad is it lowers the temperature of all the incoming air uh, adjust the rates uh, to the air conditions. It, it is also a low pressure system. There is some maintenance required and it does require, uh, for instance, in tunnel systems, we say just roughly we need two square feet of inlet per thousand CFM of fan capacity. In a uh, pad system, we're looking at 2.75 to three square feet of pad. And, and that's something you can't walk through, just to, to give you an idea. Uh, and so it doesn't adapt to all building systems. So just remember that as far as heat stress abatement methods, uh, remember saw. We need, we need uh, shade, we need air exchange, we need air movement, we need drinking water, and also air uh, or water to evaporate for those cows. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>